Good evening and welcome to Hill Beyond. This is our second monthly episode of Hill Beyond. I'm your host, head of school, Zach Lehman. And this is a, uh, a, a webcast we've been doing now for almost two years, insightful conversations with our alumni. Uh, tonight's guest is Jim Real Jr., class of 1970 and chasing the dream. Uh, Jim Real is an experienced marketing sales and strategy executive with a philosophy of learning the best from the best and leveraging that to help companies deliver the best to themselves and to their communities. He's done that by helping businesses develop competitive advantage and deploy it in the marketplace. Having grown products and services in over 20 categories on over 50 individual brands, Jim has successfully developed competitive advantage and leveraged it in the marketplace for B2B and B2C products and services spanning Fortune 500 mid-sized entrepreneurial and family-owned companies. After working in consumer product management at General Mills and Nestle, he has more recently served as an independent consultant for smaller firms who can benefit from his disciplined and analytical approach. He's a graduate of the Hill School, Dartmouth College, we'll talk about that, and Harvard Business School. He has two children and three grandsons and lives in Fairfield, Connecticut with his wife, Denise. But before all of that, he was here at the Hill School. Uh, he was a prefect, played varsity football, varsity baseball, varsity wrestling, three sport varsity athlete. That's a thing of the past. A member of the reception committee. I want to talk about that a little bit. And the radio club and the investment club. Those that make sense to me. Uh, this looks to be like, if I could guess, that looks like the basement of Wendell or definitely somewhere in Wendell. Uh, fairly acrobatic there, Jim. And um, most importantly, what we're going to talk about tonight is his new book, Chasing Down a Dream, Tales from the Middle of the Pack, about his experiences running marathons, long distance running, and um, the lessons he's learned in life about that. This book uh, came out last, uh, this past summer, and uh, I think he wrote it during the pandemic. So uh, quote uh, on the book was, I want readers to know that despite setbacks, with a little sense of humor, humility, hard work, support, and a dash of luck, one can achieve their dreams. All right, Jim, are you there? Now that I've thoroughly embarrassed you with some uh, old photos, come on, come on, join me. There we are. Hey, Jim. Technology is wonderful. Awesome. Well, glad to have you here. And I think you're, you're joining us from Fairfield, Connecticut, right? That's correct. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, it's a pleasure to meet someone who's got a Hill and Dartmouth connection. Not that, you know, neither of us are wearing green tonight, but we should be. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Well, um, we want to hear all about it, Jim. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about your Hill experience. Before we get into like where you were and how you got here and that sort of thing, tell me about the reception committee because I see that all the time in old dials and I'm never quite sure what that means. Well, that was uh, a group of people who were looking actually to have something to tell colleges we did at Hill. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we used to go over to Meg's house and when parents and candidates would come to visit, we would basically appear Natalie dressed and we would take them around campus. Oh, so you were a tour guide. Right. Oh, okay. But, but so reception, we, we, com reception committee sounded 
a much little better. nicer and a little classier. Much better. We may have to bring that back. We call it, we call them tour guides now. And then uh, if you're a head tour guide, it, the group is called Heads of Tour, sort of like Attorneys General. Okay. Well, yeah. So not bad. Not bad. Maybe we should call them Attorneys General. That would be much more impressive for colleges. <laughs> So, so it must have worked. You ended up at Dartmouth. Was that uh, where you wanted to end up? Um, it was. It was. Um, it was came down at the end to either Dartmouth or Union. So that was not a difficult choice. Sure. And, and tell me a little bit about how you came to be at Hill, Jim. Were you from the area at the time or were you from somewhere near in Connecticut or, or where were you from? Well, it was interesting because um, in the uh, year before, I came to Hill. Uh, basically, I had in the 10 months actually before I came to Hill, uh, my family had been relocated twice. So in the 10 months before I came to Hill, I had been in three schools and four states. Wow. And so it was, uh, it was crazy. Um, in order to give me the opportunity of a stable education for the rest of my high school years, uh, my family uh, gave me the opportunity, since I had toured after my eighth grade year and looked at two prep schools, Hill and Lawrenceville, uh, they said, Jim. Uh, Jim, please, sorry, you're not, you're not allowed to mention that school on this podcast, on this webcast. Well, it, the story comes out OK. OK. All right. Because they, they gave me the opportunity to select between those two schools. And so. Um, I chose Hill hands down. And the reason I did was because uh, the people seemed friendlier and down to earth. So um, it's interesting because then all these years later, when uh, you all selected the family boarding school tagline, uh, I said, wow, they really nailed it because that was why I selected Hill back in the summer of 1967. Yeah, well, actually, um... That's actually our original school name, as you may know. It, it's not really our tagline. Uh, Hill School was originally named the Family School for Young young Men and Boys. Um, that was what Mr. Meggs uh, called the school back then. We just sort of lost track of the name over the years. Uh, maybe it was too hard to say, uh, and it was just easier to say I went to the school on top of the hill, and then that became the hill. Um, but in any event, I agree with you. It is, it's definitely in our DNA, um, and, and even... Even today, I think that when, when we see students who've, who are touring both schools, that's the sentiment that they still get, you know, much more cozy, comfortable, tight-knit community here at the Hill School and definitely more of sort of a college atmosphere at, at Lawrenceville. And um, yeah, so in any event, well, I'm glad you made it here. So, but there was no family connection, no neighbors, no friends of the family or? or... No, no, actually there was not. Uh, on the other hand, at that other school that I'm not supposed to mention, uh, my late uncle had attended there, okay. so um, there was there was that connection at the other place. But despite that, I came to Hill. And and what year did you come in? What form did you start? Um, in the uh, fourth form in fourth. the fall of nineteen sixty seven. Okay, so we still had second formers then at that point. Yep. Yeah, probably not too many though. Probably like fifteen or something. Uh, it was a very very small class. And where did you uh, where did you plunk down fourth form year? What dorm were you in? Do you remember? Uh, I was in 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 uh, Markle. Markle, okay. So, what dorms did you live in during your time at Hill? Markle, and where else? Um, in Rolfe, in Wendell, and uh, that was it. Yeah. And was was I right? Was that photograph of you in Wendell? In That's Iraq? correct. Yeah. Yeah. It still looks pretty much the same, unfortunately. Uh, uh, that that uh, trademark cinder block there in Wendell Hall is is uh, one of the Wendell Halls. That's pretty easy to spot. Um, and and uh, you know what what was it like uh, finally having more stable high school environment? And and was it what you had hoped it to be um, when you arrived? And and how did things change after you've been here? Well, when I came in, um, it was it was really pretty amazing. Um, you know, I was coming in as a fourth former. You know, I was seven, 700 miles from home. It was my third school in 10 months. And, and I was initially really pretty overwhelmed. Um, but by the time uh, I got to sixth form, um, I had, well, <laughs> initially it was really pretty crazy because I went from four A's and a B 
uh, my first term in public school and my first term as a fourth former, my grades were decidedly less than that. But by the time I got to sixth form, you know, I had a pretty solid academic and, and personal grounding, you know, and I was really able to go on and, uh, you know, flourish in a lot of the institutions that I went on to. So the story had a really, really positive ending after struggling a little bit when I got here. Jim, tell our listeners about the grading system in that era. It wasn't A's and B's. It was like zero to seven or something like that, right? It was like zero to five. Five, okay. And I, and I was at the lower end when I started out. <laughs> but, but zero, it was the best possible grade, right? That's, that's correct. Yeah. Do you, do you have any idea where that came from? I had no idea. Did anyone actually get zeros? Um, I think most people aimed for ones and twos. And if they got those, they were pretty happy. <laughs> any of those appear on your transcript by the end? Um, ones and twos, actually, um, I think I ended up graduating like seventh in my class. Yeah. It was astonishing. Wow. Well, we should maybe go back to that system. It could, it could really confuse the colleges. We'll add reception committee. We'll go to a zero through, through five scale and no one will have any idea what we're doing. Uh, that might be an option. <laughs> In any event. Uh, so you ended up at, uh, before you get to Dartmouth, what were some of your activities? I know I mentioned some of them at the top of the hour. You were playing a lot of sports. Um, you were doing um, some clubs and committees, investment club. What was, how did you get involved in the sports? Had you always been a sports person? Yeah, and that's, that's kind of the theme of the book. Um, I was really very passionate about sports from the time I was really young. And one, one of the big themes of the book is that as a kid, um, one of my idols was my oldest sister's uh, boyfriend and future husband. And he was, he was my childhood idol and he was a high school varsity quarterback he was a basketball star. He was a baseball star. And he had this drawer full of varsity letter sweaters. Hmm. And I dreamed of the day that I would have a drawer full of varsity letter sweaters. And so um, that was kind of my unrealistic dream. And, uh, you know, I got to Hill and I was trying to play football. I was trying to wrestle and I was trying to play baseball. But unfortunately, I was undersized, underskilled, and under speed. And multiple Hill uh, coaching staffs figured that out really quickly. <laughs> and so, you know, I kind of ended up leaving Hill with many positive things, but not a letter sweater. Really? And that's that's kind of the that's kind of the whole theme of the book, because. Um, you know, I kind of went from there and I said, well, I didn't do that, but athletically, I'm going to do something. And that's where the marathoning came from. Well, Jim, I, we, we should be able to, I mean, maybe it's within my power to remedy that. We could send you a letter sweater, a major H sweater. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think all these years later, you've earned it in a different way. Well, that's very nice, but it, it was such a gift that I didn't get one then because it's really driven me to do some things that I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Um, all right. So you, you finish Hill with a good experience, didn't quite achieve all of your goals, but it gave you the incentive and the, and the drive to keep moving forward. You go to Dartmouth. What was that experience like? You said it, you were, you felt well prepared for Dartmouth, um, both socially and academically. Um, extremely. Um, I, in particular, you know, I, I tended to lean a little bit toward the social science sciences, um, which I had done at Hill, uh, and I ended up graduating from Dartmouth, uh, cum laude, and uh, major in U.S. history, minor in education, uh, came out of there with a certificate to teach in uh, the state of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and went on and ended up for two years out of Dartmouth teaching junior high school in uh, southeastern Massachusetts okay. in public schools. And what was that like going from a place like Hill and Dartmouth to a junior high school, public school? You're sort of back to your roots, right? Where you had started. Um, it was kind of interesting because um, I'm sure you're, you don't have second formers anymore, but your third formers are, I'm sure, very highly motivated. Um, my eighth and ninth graders weren't always so. 
Yeah. Um, but we had a lot of fun, actually. Um, even though some of mine weren't, uh, in particular, my first year in eighth grade, um, we had a lot of fun. I didn't have enough, enough textbooks to teach US history. So I ended up writing my own curriculum. And, uh, you know, my philosophy was let's learn by doing, let's not do a lot of memorizing, let's not do a lot of lectures. Instead, let's uh, do simulation gaming. Um, you know, a couple of my units, uh, one I had had my young scholars um, reproduce artifacts from the 1805 Connecticut frontier. Uh, another of, of my units, we did a simulation game and I uh, divided the class in half. Uh, one half was the North, one half was the South, and we refought the American Civil War. Hmm. So um, we did that kind you were, of stuff. You were, a, you were an educator ahead of your time, Jim. Uh, we had a good time. Yeah, yeah, we had a good time. That's awesome. Um, so you did that for two years, and then clearly you got into the business world. What drove you out of out of teaching to the business world? Um, just the thought. I had come out of uh, Dartmouth really wanting to go to grad school, um, but um, thinking that I, I wanted to do something before I did that, and so did the teaching route for a couple of years, and then applied to grad school, had initially thought, maybe law, maybe business, uh, ended up selecting business and was fortunate enough to get into Harvard. Um, that was a perfect program because um, I was a real neophyte in business and the first year at Harvard, uh, they uh, required everybody, even people with business experience to take a base curriculum where uh, everybody took the same courses, accounting, marketing, um, operations, everybody took the same thing. So you got a grounding in all the basic business disciplines. And that was perfect for me. So uh, it went from there. And it was really helpful. And I assume they were using the case method at the time. Oh, yeah. 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 That, that was lots and uh, lots of cases. That was a little bit of a, a new thing for you then? Um, it was. And interestingly enough, and I talk about this in the book, I it took me a little while to catch on because the first time I went to classes, um, I read the three cases. We got three a day. Um, I read the three cases, um, didn't know I was supposed to analyze them and recommend a solution, set them aside and went out for a run. <laughs> Fortunately, I sat up in the nosebleed section and didn't get called on the first couple of days, but I figured it out pretty quick and I was okay after that. Sure. Well, I, I went to the law school across the river and uh, I remember those, and they didn't use a case, case method, but we certainly used the Socratic method, and um, those were those were uh, stressful times. You didn't know whether you were going to be called on, and how well prepared you were. And did you did you choose the one night to take off from reading when you're going to get called on? That's interesting. So you went for a run. So that my next question was going to be sort of when did the running begin for you? Um, well, I mean, did it begin at Hill, or or did you start getting more serious about it later? Well, it was funny because I was hoping it would begin at Hill. Um, they had something which I'm sure you don't have anymore. Um, but in fifth form, there was something called the Hill Marathon. It wasn't a real marathon. It was an eight mile road race. And um, I ran in it in fifth form and the competition couldn't have been very distinguished because I ended up finishing fourth. And that was without any kind of training. And so I thought, well, Maybe I should, instead of trying to play football with my diminutive frame, perhaps I should run cross country. And so um, I talked to Clifford Little, who was the cross country coach at the time. And I said, hey, coach, can I have a tryout? And he had this phenomenal team at the time. And in my sixth form year, they ended up going undefeated. But he was a nice man. And he said, sure, Jim, you can, you can try out. So we went over to the track. And... I have this horrible stride. It's really kind of a shuffle. And, you know, he watched me run on the track and he said, Jim, he said, stick to football. <laughs> so I, I stuck to football and that was that. So I didn't get started in running at Hill. But the next year when I went to Dartmouth, um, you know, I was so athletically incompetent that there was no way I'd do any intercollegiate athletics at Dartmouth. And so I started running on my own there. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful place to run. I was just up there yeah, this past weekend for homecoming. Uh, I, as I mentioned before the show, my son is a senior there playing on the football team. It was 
exciting to be back up there, but just reminded me of what a beautiful place that is and the outdoors and all the options to be outside. We went for a nice hike that, uh, on that morning and boy, it's a, it's a, it's just a rich environment when it comes to being outdoors. It sure is. It sure yeah. is. So when did you run your first competitive race? Um, was it while you were at Dartmouth or not until a little while later? Well, it was, um, I really didn't run any competitive races until I ran my first Boston marathon. Oh. And that was, that was my senior year at Dartmouth in 1974. And, uh, I was a bandit, which meant I wasn't registered and I just tucked in the back of the pack and I just ran it. And, uh, that was, uh, the bug had bitten me by then. And, uh, from there I went on and, you know, ran another, um, 13 marathons and, you know, went on from there. So what inspired you to do a, the marathon in terms of going down to Boston? You know, that takes a lot of effort to get down there. Even then it was a big deal. I mean, now it's an even bigger deal, but uh, being a bandit is a little bit challenging at times. Um, I've, I've watched a number of Boston marathons having lived there for a long time. How did you choose that to be your first marathon? And um, how, how did you get well, over that? Yeah, I mean, it was it was just something that for some reason I had read a couple articles while I was at Dartmouth about it and just was something, I guess, after um, my previous athletic experiences, it just kind of seemed like that was going to be my Mount Everest. And so once I decided that, um, I, I ran the first one and then I just wanted to get better and better. And then uh, my second year of teaching, I happened to teach with a with a fellow named Scott Graham. And Scott Graham happened to be running with the Greater Boston Track Club. And Scott and I started going uh, running after school because he lived near my apartment. And so Scott said, well, why don't you, why don't you join the Greater Boston Track Club? And in the Greater Boston Track Club happened to be a couple of guys named Bill Rogers and Alberto Salazar. Hmm. So now all of a sudden, I'm going up to Boston College. I'm going up to Tufts in the winter and I'm working out with Bill Rogers and Alberto Salazar. And it's like, then I'm seeing how, how the big guys do it. And those were the keys to the kingdom. I mean, it was like unbelievable. Did you, so did, then you I, change, did you change your stride at that point and you're or were um, you still I, shuffling along? No, I was still shuffling along, but I, I knew what those guys did to get as fast as they could, could be. And at least I could use the, the methods that they use. And I knew that I could get better. At first, I thought I could run a 220. That never happened. But, you know, I knew I could get a lot faster than I had been. What was your, what was your time in the first marathon? 340. 340. It's pretty good. Now, it, it strikes me as interesting that your first real race is a marathon and the Boston Marathon. Is that because, I mean... These days, every weekend, there's a 5K or a 10K. Was it not the case back then? There were just marathons and some half marathons, that sort of thing? Yeah, there weren't, there weren't as many then. And I really hadn't, you know, I was, I was such, a, uh, <laughs> I was such a, a novice that um, I didn't realize that racing was going to be a good way to build my speed as well. So I wasn't really seeking out the races. Um, by the time I got done, you know, I was using the races very consciously to build my speed and get faster building up to a marathon. By the end of it, by the end, you know, I, I hit, ran in something like 115 or 120 road races throughout my career, uh, not including the marathon. So um, they were really a good tool as far as, you know, building your conditioning and your speed. Right. Um, when you when you ran that first marathon, and I'll move on to the other marathons in a second. I'm just fascinated by this. Uh, did you was anyone there to watch you? Did you have family there, or did you just drive down to Boston and jump in and and start running? No, the first the first time, um, you know, Denise and I were married by then, so she we jumped in our Volkswagen Beetle, drove over from Duxbury, jumped in and and you know ran. Uh, I think my sister might have been there. That was about it. Yeah. Wow. And so you said, I didn't catch the number. Is it 13 more marathons after that or total? Um, 17 total, but uh, three of them were DNFs. Okay. 
did not finish. Yeah, I got that one. Seven. So seventeen. Um, what was your best time? Um, two forty three forty five. Two forty. I'm writing it down here. Two forty three forty five. Wow. And where was that marathon? That was at Grandma's Marathon in Duluth, Minnesota, the flattest course you could ever want. <laughs> and did you hang them up after that? Was that your best time and you called it a day or was that somewhere in the middle? No, I didn't call it a day. I found, and this is kind of, you, you kind of see this as you go through the book. It's, you know, I was getting, at that point, I was, uh, you know, I was in my early 30s and life's demands and injuries, you know, it kind of closes in on you and it was it was time for me to uh focus less on that and other things that i needed to do yeah so meanwhile you, you start a career right in business and uh did that right. career take you all over the world all over the country or were you pretty much still in new england um actually out of business school i went to work for general mills so we left boston and went to minneapolis Right. And, uh, you know, was doing some traveling uh, as I did that primarily domestic traveling. Um, but we were we were in Minneapolis for about six years and then uh, came back to Nestle, where we were in White Plains, New York, for four years. And then uh, from there, uh, we uh, were uh, basically uh, went into after I had spent about a decade in uh, with world leading consumer marketing companies, I developed a toolkit, uh, some disciplines, some uh, ways to manage companies uh, that I found were very helpful with less sophisticated, smaller companies. And so I, I took those tools and went into the paper business. So I spent some time there, um, worked for a company called Fort Howard out in Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, worked for a company called Wausau Mosinee uh, for a while in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Um, and from there then uh, segued into some other industries, did some consulting, but all the while taking the original tools and disciplines that I had developed at General Mills and Nestle and uh, you know, helped companies that were either uh, in trouble or needed some help getting to the next step. Um, and uh, that was that was kind of my modus operandi moving forward. And it's still some of what I'm doing today. And, and what role did running play in your business life? Um, was it simply a way to blow off steam and stay in shape or was there more to it than that? Um, that's an interesting question. It was, it was really, um, while I was at General Mills, it was it was more than that. Um, one of the things that I did uh, was I organized a running club at General Mills. And, you know, I don't know if, if you remember this, but for a while, Runner's World magazine did something called the Corporate Cup Relays. And there actually was a, a national competition for corporations where they had regional competitions between the corporations, and then they had a national national track meet for the corporations out in Palo Alto, California. And that was in the early 80s. Hmm. And so we actually had a team at General Mills and three years in a row, our team went out to California and competed. Now we got killed because we didn't have many track runners, but um, we were doing that at General Mills. Um, as I got to Nestle, um, we, it was more to blow off steam. And then as I got along in my career, I had some physical problems and could do less running. And so that was the point at which I was uh, doing more non-impact exercise. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite running experience um, over the years, um, perhaps other than your top time was, was there, it sounds like you met a lot of interesting people along the way. Um, you had a couple of DNFs that those could be good stories. I'm sure, uh, maybe not good stories, but, uh, what were some of the anecdotes that you remember that really stood out for you over your running career? Um, I think probably the most interesting things were some of the workouts for the greater Boston track club. 
where you saw what, what those guys were running and how fast they were going. I mean, it was unbelievable. I, they were, we would go and do the track workouts and we did something, what we did were workouts that were called ladders and they'd start out and they would do, you know, a 220, then a 440, you know, an eighth of a mile, a quarter of a mile, a half a mile, three quarters of a mile, a mile, and then they go back that, to go those distances down. And then as we got closer to the marathon, it would be a half mile, a mile, um, a mile and a half, two mile, and then walk it down. And these guys were running, like they were running a four minute mile pace. Um, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. And, you know, I'm there poking along at like maybe a, maybe a 75 minute quarter pace. And just to see what they were doing was just unbelievable. And um, the other, we were running with a coach by the name of Bill Squires, who was probably the preeminent marathon coach of the time. And he had really a three prong program. One was the track workouts where his philosophy was that uh, what you needed to do on the track was run faster than you would in the marathon. So that when you were running in the marathon, the pace actually felt comfortable. What you needed to do was complement that with running a lot of hills. Uh, when we ran in Boston, he had us actually run the hills of the marathon just repeatedly. That was a big deal to him. And then the third piece was to run weekly mileage in the 125 mile range. So, you know, you were doing that. And those were the three things that um, he got me doing. And that's what got me to the point, you know, of running a, a 243 marathon. Yeah. Um, and just to go back to my earlier question, you, you talked about the role that running played in your career. It sounds like there's some real strategic learning practices, disciplines that you learned in Boston and maybe beyond. You talked about having some disciplines that you developed in business. Was there ever any crossover there, any of the lessons from that you were learning in Boston with the, with the running team, running club um, that, that, you know, permeated into your, your business world? I, I think there was, I mean, not directly, but I think, you know, it was really the devil is in the details and the devil is in the hard work. And as an example, as I started to take the stuff that I learned at, at General Mills and Nestle to other companies, it was really like, I would start with a company, take it as an example, I mentioned the commercial a commercial paper division that I went to work for. And I came in the front door at that place and they had lost $10 million the year before. And I'm the new VP of sales and marketing. And my boss says, Jim, he says, we lost $10 million last year and you're just reporting to work today. And guess what? You and I have a meeting with a CEO in six weeks and you're going to tell them how you're going to fix this mess. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I guess I better get to work. And so in six weeks, I basically um, diagnosed the business and I went into the details that I found out, found out where the problems were by really getting in and understanding where the money was leaking. And it was, you know, it's similar in that um, you have to get into the details and you have to do the hard work and you have to understand where the problems are. And I had those tools on the running, on the running side of the business. I had the tools to attack. I knew what to do to get better. And from Nestle and General Mills, I had the tools to go in there and figure that out. Oh. So it's, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing and it's kind of not. Yeah. No, I, I have a similar sort of philosophy when it comes to hiring people. I, I love to hire people who have been athletes and not necessarily world-class athletes. I, I like to hire people that have had to work at it to be athletes and um, have, have learned those disciplines of endurance and hard work and, you know, coming back from a loss or a failure and, and all of those things. It sounds like um, those, those loomed large in your, in your uh, running career as well as in your uh, business career. All right, well, let, let's jump ahead. Uh, at some point, you say, I'm going to write a book about this. Um, how long were you saying that before you actually started? Um, quite a while. 
<laughs> I'd say I'd say probably probably ten or fifteen years, maybe longer. Um, Denise encouraged me, but uh, the thing about it was um, I didn't really know how to do it, and I certainly didn't have the time. Um, what what motivated me or what changed? Um, a couple things. Uh, one was in 2019. Uh, I worked with a colleague of mine, um, and her name is uh, Libby Connolly Alexander. And Libby wrote a book called Figuring It Out. And the storyline there was uh, Libby's father's company uh, started in 1978 with zero revenue. And by 2014, they were doing $300 million in revenue, and they sold the company for $700 million. So she was writing a book all about that fabulous story. And I, I figured if Libby could write a book, and I, I respect Libby tremendously, but I figured if she could write a book, I probably could write a book. And I had seen all everything she went through, so I, I knew what it involved. The second thing that, that really um, was the motivation was the pandemic. And so all of a sudden, I'm, I'm here in April 2020, and I have all this time on my hands. So um, it's time to get out the laptop and start writing. And those were the two things that really got me off the snide. Had you, even before that, had you sat down and written an outline or started a chapter, or was it all just in your head sort of moving around until you had pulled out the laptop in April? It was, it was all in my head. And that was the, that was the surprising thing is um, that, I really didn't have an outline. I never had an outline. I just started writing it. And as things came into my head that I wanted to put in, I just tacked them on the end of the manuscript and just, you know, sorted them out chronologically. And I kept going. And um, if I ever write another book, it's not going to be that easy. <laughs> so start to finish, how long did it take you to write the first draft? Um, it took me about uh, five and a half months. And while you're writing, um, what's your method? What you know, you were you said it sort of came out. There wasn't an outline, but are you like wake up, have your cup of coffee, start writing? Uh, did you have? Did you start looking for a publisher? How, how did that all come about? Um, really, it it varied. Um, some days I I didn't really have set hours. Um, it, it would depend on, you know, how I was feeling. Some days I'd sit down and hammer away for six hours. Other days, if I didn't feel like it, I wouldn't do it. Um, as far as the publishing, I had a couple ways I could go. Um, I could either uh, look for a conventional publishing, publishing house like Simon & Schuster, or I could self-publish. Um, it was interesting because I have a neighbor in Connecticut who uh, went through the conventional publishing house in talking to her, she had published 30 novels. She said to get published the first time for her, she had to hire an agent and it took 18 months. Um, the other option, self-publishing, I could pay a publishing company a certain amount and they would basically edit the book, they'd design it, uh, design the inside of the book and the cover and they would publish it and I could do that within a span of about six months. And so since I wanted to get the story out and the self-publishing route was um, to me easier, cheaper and faster, that was that was the, the route that I took. Um, interestingly, my father just wrote a book, his first book as well. And so I had a- Congratulations. A, yeah, well, uh, and he's right now doing some book tours and um, you know events and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so it's been interesting to watch him do that. And it, it sounds quite similar. He's been, he's had this idea for probably 20 years, but never sat down to do it. And once he sat down to do it, we all had to yell at him to keep writing. You know, we, you know, <laughs> he was, he always wanted to do something else. We said, you know, got to finish a chapter today, dad. And um, really wanted to see him uh, finish that. So, so um, uh, who was reading it along the way? Who did you, who were your trusted editors and reviewers and confidants? Well, um, my wife was one, and then I had about four other editors who, when I got done, I, I sent it to them and, um, you know, had them read it. And I got some very, very good, insightful comments from them. And, uh, you know, it was 
uh, four four of my closest friends. One of one one guy who went to business school with me. One was um, Scott Graham, who was the my friend from Greater Boston Track Club. I wanted to make sure I was telling that part of the story correctly. Um, another was uh, a colleague of mine from uh, uh, one of my last permanent positions who had experience in uh, publishing. And, uh, you know, so all in all, I tried to uh, pick people with very backgrounds who would make sure that I wasn't saying anything stupid. <laughs> and was there any um, person from Hill? Uh, we never, we didn't talk about your teachers at Hill, but that impacted your writing. And um, a lot of people talk about boarding school and Hill in particular being a place where they learn to write for the first time or write well. Um, I'm wondering if any of our sort of legendary writing instructors and English instructors were influential for you. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I did a lot of writing at Hill, but um, kind of the way the way the book is written, um, probably the biggest um, influence probably the biggest writing experience I had at Hill was probably writing letters to people. Hmm. And to the extent that it was influenced by, um, I would say it probably is less academic writing and more correspondence. Yeah. So I, who, I always who were you writing letters to? Writing to home, writing to family, friends? Friends, yeah, friends, family. And I was always going on creative bents when I was writing letters. And that probably, if I hadn't been at the Hill, I probably wouldn't have been writing those letters. So indirectly, uh, yes, I, I would say there was an influence there. Did you recover any of those letters ever? Did anyone save them? Um, I don't think so. Oh. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> well, never know. There might've been some good pieces in there. All right, so you finish the book, you decide to self-publish. Um, you've had a few people read it, ready to go straight to Amazon. Is that, is that the method these days? Yeah, basically what happens is, uh, once it's ready to go, um, it basically uploads to Amazon and it's available, available for sale. And that's the last plug I will offer tonight. <laughs> well, so it's online. How many, uh, how many copies did you have to purchase in advance or pre-purchase with the editor or publisher? And uh, how's the, how are sales going so far? Well, um, it's interesting. I didn't have to pre-purchase any because the way, the way it works is the copies are printed to demand. Oh. So there are no copies printed until there are orders. And so, so far, you know, the book is selling quite, quite well. Um, and the way I've marketed it so far is um, I basically um, pushed it out to what I would call a fit, my, my, my affinity groups, which would be family, friends, um, the Hill, Dartmouth, Harvard Business School. Now that it's fall, um, I'm looking at putting more social media behind it and maybe some measured media. Um, so, you know, I haven't really gotten into serious marketing yet. Yeah. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, um, I've gotten some really nice uh, uh, book reviews on it that, it that folks have posted out on Amazon. So um, yeah. I'm, really, I'm really pretty encouraged for, for a first time, right? And, and I those, didn't know how it would yeah. be received. And those positive reviews obviously help the Amazon algorithm and it gets pushed further and further up uh, people's searches and that sort of thing. And that's, uh, that's how it goes, I guess. So. All, all of you listening tonight, you got to go and read the book and post a good review and get Jim some more, some more stars out there uh, as well, right? Would be appreciated. <laughs> now, did you did you reserve the movie rights? That's what I want to know. Um, haven't had any nibbles yet, but uh, that's uh, that would be nice. Who who will play you in the movie, Jim? Oh, I've I've, I've been ready for that question all along and I'm thinking it's going to be Dwayne the Rock Johnson <laughs> that's what I always say that's who's going to play me that's not fair Jim well well you you've got a better shot at that than I do I have a closer hairdo anyway um well uh I, I have a few more questions but I you know we have a, we have a number of people here listening in so um if people want to ask some questions I'd encourage you to 
um, type them into the Q&A box or the chat box um, or raise your hand um, and we'll call on you and uh, get a few questions in here uh, for Jim before the night is over. Um, Jim, um, as you think back on your running career, your business career, and now your writing career, how do you how do you connect all of that? And like, what do you think has driven you all these years um, to be successful uh, in these three areas? Because clearly, you know, you had a you had a great running career. You had a, this really interesting, diverse business career, and and now you written your first book in a matter of months and it's doing well. So um, how, how do you connect all of that success and, and, and what do you, what do you attribute to that? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, I like to think I've been pretty lucky actually. Um, you know, I was, you know, I, I, I think, and I, I kind of touched on this um, in the acknowledgements in my book Um I've had, had a lot of good people who have invested in me. And, uh, you know, the, the big break I got early on was having a chance to go to Hill. And I'm not trying to blow smoke. I mean, um, that kind of set the stage for um, a lot of good things happening to me. And, um, you know, having tools, having um, the opportunity to, to kind of build success upon success. And I think with a, with a good foundation, um, I've been able to do a lot of good things and it's, you know, it's not, it's not just about me. It's about um, the people who have helped me get, get to uh, what I've done and what I've become. So um, that's kind of how I think about it. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of that's been uh, very fortunate uh, from where I sit. Well, Jim, we don't have the um, Hill Marathon anymore. Uh, we do still have a fitness test and we have a one mile run at the end of the year that anyone can enter unless you're on the varsity track team. Um, and <laughs> so, uh, we have that, for, we have a mile champion for boys and for girls, and it gets put up on a, a poster or a, um, a plaque in the, in the, uh, in the gym. Um, and one of the things that I've always admired as I look back in old dials and talk to alumni is, uh, at Lawrenceville weekend, and maybe this was true on all weekends, but the cross country race would finish at halftime in the football stadium. Um, and I've been trying to bring that back uh, for Lawrenceville weekend. And um, it seems to be quite complicated because you got to cross the street and all, all sorts of stuff. But uh, I guess that was a pretty cool tradition in the, in the day. Yeah, that was, that was something that, that was done that was really, it was very cool. Yeah. And we've we've maintained a tradition of really strong cross country teams and track teams here at the Hill over the years. Um, you know, and we're and we're doing well this fall. Uh, we have we have some good teams. We'll see if we can give Lawrenceville a run for their money on November 6th. Um, Great. So. All right. Well, we have our first question. It comes from one of your classmates, Rick Bragdon. And he writes, uh, Jim, your classmate, Rick Bragdon here. What was your very best, perhaps most life shaping shaping experience at the Hill? What was an experience either of you, your own doing, or the schools that was particularly difficult or negative? I guess this is several questions. It might take us all night here, Jim. Uh, also, to what do you attribute in our experience at the Hill, the fact that our classmates have been to date so apathetic about engaging with the school? What would you suggest that we can do to improve that engagement? So I think it's a four point question. Best, most life-shaping experience, worst or diff most difficult or negative experience uh and uh, i guess three points and and why is your class why is the class of 1970 not with it yet well i think i'm going to answer uh the first two uh in one response uh most negative and the most positive um and it really is it com it kind of goes back to a question Zach, that you asked Barry McCarthy over the summer, and that was, what was your favorite part of going to Hill School? And he, he answered graduating. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, so I, you know, that line was used, but um, my favorite part of going to Hill School, and Rick, I hope I'm not eluding your question, but my worst part was getting to Hill School, the Hill School, 
and being totally overwhelmed. And the best part was over time, uh, actually coming to enjoy some success out of a place where I had initially been totally overwhelmed. That was, that meant a lot to me. Now, in terms of engaging our classmates, um, that's a real challenge. And I know you're trying to do it. The reunion class is trying to do it. Um, 1968, 69, 70, that was a difficult time. Um, we had a lot of hard cases in our class. Um, and uh, there was, as you will well remember, in fact, if you look at our yearbook, there is a certain letter in that yearbook from Mr. Montgomery, which took a pretty hard edge uh, in terms of discipline. Yeah. And uh, I think it's gonna be, it, it will be hard to re-engage people, but I think, um, I think we're doing what we can to bring people back together. And I think we'll uh, see that at the reunion and perhaps Lawrenceville weekend. Yeah. Um, keep well, up yeah. the good work. Yeah, I. Um, uh, so I'm actually pretty good friends with Arch Montgomery, who is Tad Montgomery's son. Um, and Arch um, uh, was the head of school uh, at Asheville School in North Carolina, another boarding school. He was the head of school at Gilman School in Baltimore. So we've known each other for a while. He actually tried to hire me a long time ago to be a uh, uh, history and history teacher and wrestling coach. But in any event, um, I asked him one time why he didn't go to Hill, because when his father uh, was the head of school here, the headmaster, he ended up going to Westminster. And uh, he said, I can remember as clear as day, Zach. Um, I said to my father, well, we're going to Hill. I should go to Hill. And he said, son, I've got to do some really tough things when I go to Hill. Uh, you don't want to be there and you don't want to be my son <laughs> there. And so he ended up at Westminster. And I, I know he had to do some hard things at the school. Um, yeah, as, as you say, I've seen that letter, um, but it was definitely a, a challenging time for the school. But, you know, a number of your classmates and, and much credit to Rick for engaging his cl the class and, um, and, and some of the, you know, classes around you. 71 has been really active and uh, 72 has been pretty active. So um, I'm glad to see that some of you are coming back and getting reengaged. Um, so. Um, well, there's someone posting on here uh, in the chat room who must have your link, your login link, because they're coming up as Jim Real. And they say, uh, hey, Jim, I believe I have more than a few of your letters, possibly including some from the Hill School and old Real to Real tapes, a few. I'm not sure who's uh, typing that. Whoever's typing that, could you put your name in the chat there and we'll know who you are? Um, in any event, uh, any questions? Um, we had a good question there from Rick. We have some other folks on the call. Any other questions for Jim tonight, either about his book or about his time at Hill or his career, uh, what it's like to publish? You can raise your hand or you can type it in. Uh, here we go. It's, uh, it says it's Ali or Ali, A-L-I. That was who it was, Jim. Do you know who that is? Yes, it is Alan Noble, who is uh, was actually a friend of mine from, from Hudson, Ohio. Uh, who went to public school with me and a uh, very famous cross country runner who was my original running muse. Got it. He wasn't the one with all the letter sweaters in his drawer, was he? No. <laughs> but a right. very good high school cross country runner in his own right. Well, while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, um, Jim, I'll ask another one. Uh, what, what sure. message do you have for, um, or what advice do you have for our current students or young alumni um, as they navigate Hill and navigate their early careers and maybe you're interested in, in running um, or you know, consumer marketing, that sort of thing? What, what's the best advice you could give? If you could give yourself advice you know, as an age 17 or 18 year old Hill student, what would you say? I think I would I would suggest that you know they'd be very open to a lot of different options. Uh, I don't think I was as much when I was that age. It was kind of point A to point B, and uh, 
in particular, um, as I was coming out of Harvard Business School, um, I was pretty uh, intent on doing what I had done before. And uh, I didn't, didn't consider a lot of different things. And uh, I think that was probably a mistake in retrospect. Yeah. Well, being open-minded, growth-minded, um, considering a lot of options, that's great advice. Well, Jim, thanks for making time. For, oh, there's one question uh, or comment here from Wallace Gundy. And she says, Jim, this has been fascinating. I started running a decade ago. And while I'm quite slow, you've inspired me to keep on going. I am also your newest customer. Looking forward to reading your book when in, uh, in the next week or next week. Uh, oh, when it arrives next week. Thanks and go Hill, Wallace Gundy, 04. Well, you sold a thank book you, tonight. Wallace. You sold a book tonight. Thank you, Jim. Wallace. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Wallace. Uh, Good luck. And we're going to have a, uh, we're going to have your book on display here for our students. Hopefully a number of them will check it out from the library and, and learn more about it. And uh, are you going to be here for uh, Lawrenceville weekend, Jim? Um, I hope to be there. Yes. Great. Well, we are hosting, it's our 100 and what is it? Our 134th uh, year, I think. Um, it's going to be quite a weekend. We have a lot of alumni coming back. We have the Centennial Hall of Fame, we have the Bissell Hall of Fame, and then we have our annual Hall of Fame uh, as well, and Red Meat Dinner and Pep Rally, and, and we hold the Meg's Cup, uh, the Meg's Green Cup right now, Jim, which didn't exist in your time, but um, basically it's uh, whoever wins more contests that weekend gets to keep the cup, and we are the, in the one year that we've had it, because we had one year that we had it, and then we had a pandemic, uh, we have won it, and we have it here at Hill, and we hope to keep it here, so... Um, hopefully you'll be there to see us hoist that at the end of the day after the, the last competition, which I think is field hockey in the in the early evening hours. And our field hockey team, not to brag or anything, but we're ranked number five in the country right now, Jim. So wow, that'll be a Excellent. fun way to finish uh, an exciting day. Jim, thanks for making time for us. Congratulations on your book. Uh, congratulations on your career, and thanks for sharing your story here tonight with our listeners and for being a proud Hill alumnus. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I am just going to, before we sign off for the night, I'm going to share my screen again. And there's the book. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to go online, Chasing Down a Dream, Tales from the Middle of the Pack. Uh, I don't know what just happened with my screen. Uh, we have uh, our next episode of Hill Beyond. will uh, be on November 16th. And we'll feature Liz Burton, class of 2000, who is the chief investment officer uh, for the Employees Retirement State System of the State of Hawaii, getting a lot of press these days. And we're going to hear about her journey to Hawaii, her journey in the investment world. Um, and uh, she's got a lot, of sh lot to share. She's also a member of our board of trustees. So I hope you will tune in on November 16th. Thanks for being here tonight. A special thanks to Jim. And I uh, hope you have a great night. <laughs>